All right, everybody, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good? Excited about WordCamp? Excited about being indoors on this very hot day? <laughs> I know, me too. So, oh, this is bad. I'm just going to have to slide here a bit. Because I started that on the very last slide.
unfortunately built quite a few of those websites back in the day, and honestly, I can't understand how a client could ever update them looking at it right now. And while that specific example is long gone, thankfully, we still have a way to go on editing our websites today. And to get there, we need to think about our users, and we need to, to put our users hat on and think about users, 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 in the word of Steve Ballmer. And we do that by thinking about psychology. We know a lot about how humans work, how we think, how we operate, how we make decisions, why we do things. And looking at this, we can actually form and know what a good interface would be, how we can, as lazy humans, make it easy for us to actually do all of these things. But we need to think about the case as a user and not the easy way out as a developer or a designer. And what I'm proposing, and what we'll be proposing in the rest of is basically going to be, if I may say so, a win-win-win situation where as a designer you'll be able to design sites that are more aesthetically appealing and developers are able to create technically advanced platforms and then again users will be able to edit WordPress and edit their sites much better. At the core of this comes I believe responsibility in the client's organization. This is really hard to change because often you know, as an HDR developer, to say we're brought in to fix the website, but many times we actually need to position it in the organization and say, well, someone needs to be responsible for updating this website, and someone actually needs to do it. Well, we can help clients ensure that, yes, indeed, there is someone responsible. We can't really help them unless they pay us to do so, which many clients won't. We can actually help them follow up and see that this person is actually doing their job. We have to leave some responsibility for our clients. But we have to teach them and educate them on the fact that, well, someone needs to be responsible for checking and make sure the update that we have, the content that we have such a date. And a good way to ensure that a website is easy to update is employing the principle of no education necessary. We shouldn't have to teach our clients in depth how to use their website. Well, in part we do. So if someone's going to update the website, they need to know a little bit about how to write effective content that resonates with, a, with someone who reads it, a reader. They need to um, know a little bit about SEO so that they can optimize their page slightly. They need to know, you know a little bit about tracking. They, they need to have some grasp of the fundamentals in web. But they shouldn't need an in-depth lesson on how to go about actually you know, editing the content of the platform. And it's not as hard to get there as you might think. What we need to do is start creating what I would call self-explanatory editing interfaces. Which basically guide the user through the entire process. By labels, by descriptions, by clear, easy buttons. Not by having to go find a page that's hidden three levels deep, that may have a field that's partially hidden, which updates a part of a block on a front page. That's not where you would logically attempt to find this information. Then we have, I want to talk about two things which are going to make this easier for us. One thing is going to be custom post types, and the other is going to be page builders. And each has a specific use case and a specific important place in our toolkit. So let's start with custom post types. Now, these have been around forever, uh, forever and ever now, it seems like. And they're really, really awesome. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with them. But the biggest benefit that they bring is something that I would call a structured data input. Which means we can input data in a specific field which, which has a specific purpose. And I'm going to come back to the You're going to be tired of me talking about structured data inputs by the end of the session. But I think it's really, really important to get a good interface and have it actually work for all the types of users we have on the website. It might look something like this. This is, um, this is a view we built for our clients. This is nothing, nothing spectacular. It's just um, advanced custom fields added up to, for example, enter a client here. So you guide the user to, to add a logo, uh, some other information, you have descriptions, and this is for our own website, so we've decided not to be extremely verbose in what the descriptions you write. But for example, when you upload an image, let the user know that you're taking care of the scaling, that, that you, maybe you have some requirements of transparency, but then you're going to take care of the scaling, so that when the user is hit with this page, they know, oh, Right, I just need to do that. I don't need to think about all of these other 
thinks, but if I do what the description says, then it's going to be perfect. And I don't think anyone that's going to come into an interface and they're going to be guided by this, they're going to feel pretty comfortable in just walking through box per box, and they're going to know what we're doing with the data as well. Now, of course, to finish it off, um, the enter title here, top should probably not say enter title here. You definitely need to change that to, for example, at the client name. It's um, and it's because it's not a title, it's a client name, and, and that's important to remember. So all these tiny details help us. And I think we're a little bit afraid of, of actually employing much, many post types. Um, this is a screenshot for one of our projects, and we have so many post types on this site. But what we did is we looked and we sat down and looked, all right, so what do we need to query, you know, programmatically, what do we need to get as a listing, what do we need to sort in taxonomy, so we figured, well, all of these things we actually need to be able to query and retrieve in ways that we do in a specific post type. And we also want to relate them to one another. While WordPress doesn't have relationships strictly built in, we can find workarounds for it. And we definitely want to relate the client to a case study so we can pull in that information flexibly, etc., etc., etc. What we found is, of course, post types make sense. If you want to go a little bit farther, you could always extend this by grouping together the options under different menu labels so that you don't have a huge array of menu labels for custom post types. All of that, of course, helps the client experience. But let's say we're here to add a service to this page, a marketable service. Then when we're hit with the admin panel, we're browsing through the left-hand sidebar, and we're immediately going to see that, oh, there's services, and oh, add new. That's exactly what I wanted. And then we're getting into the, some sort of an interface. Now, the problem, if we keep my service as an example, we're going to morph over to a bit of page builder uh, stuff, and that is, not all content can be created by fields arranged in a specific order. How would you, for example, define common fields for a marketing a service? You, you can in some cases, but in some cases what we're talking about is a landing page style, marketing style page, which is going to be different. It's going to have different blocks. You want to lay it out differently. You want the content to be different. You want it to each page to look and feel different. There's some, the, the common thing, there are a few common things about these pages. And for that, I think we need page builders. Now, there's going to be a talk about comparing page builders later on in this track today. So if you're unsure about page builders, definitely go check that out. Uh, so I'm going to be a little bit light on comparing page builders for that reason. So why would you ever use a page builder? Well, the first best promise is there's no coding required. As a designer or as a client, as a user, what you can do is pick from a range of different blocks. You can arrange them. You can type in the content, your guide, and you can create this beautiful layout uh, without knowing any code. And that's also the thing. We get a promise of a beautiful layout. We're promised a site that's going to look gorgeous once you just drop these blocks in places. I say promise off, and I'm going to come back to that in just a little while. So the land of page builder plugins, we've got a lot of them. We've got a whole array of some ranging from very, very, very bad ones that don't ever use them to some that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to present the ideal page folder plugin, which hasn't been built yet, unfortunately. Uh, but again, if you're interested in a bit of an overview of, of page folders, again, there's going to be a talk in this session later on today comparing five of them. So go check that out if you're interested. So page builders are exactly what we need. Unfortunately, most available plugins are not exactly. And by that I mean page builders as a concept is pretty interesting, right? We can pick and choose from modules, we can make it easy for, for someone to create a beautiful page without screwing up our design. So why aren't they what we need right now? Well, there are some pitfalls, right? And the first is most of them hard code design for components. Say I'm adding 10 text blocks. I would ideally want each text block to have a fixed padding, I want a fixed margin, I may want the border or background color. You know, I've got that defined. But in most of these page builders, I'm allowed to set my own padding per element per page. So what happens when I go and change that design? I just want to make it a little bit you know, more padding on each of the boxes. Well, either I have to go find and replace, or I have to go through all of the elements and all of the pages manually. I don't, I, I don't like to do that. 
in the day and age where we're talking about modular CSS and how to reuse and how to create modules, we still have something like this, which is basically so far from modular and easy to maintain as we could possibly come, almost. And plus, we're giving end users design control. Who ever thought that was a good idea? Well, premium <laughs> theme builders, here's the thing, premium theme builders, of course, cater to so many different, and I think that's a, a, this is a huge problem that we're catering to too many in one product. Um, but looking at more bespoke design features, we don't want to give an end user too much design control. I'm not talking about, you know, not letting users select from a predefined list of background colors, for example, but we've spent so much time creating this wonderful graphical brand, we've created a logo, we've developed colors, we have a perfect typographic scale. We have so much that we've done to create a beautiful, beautiful brand. And then we're asking the user and saying, hey, you, you can change any background color, you can select from anything in the color wheel. Right? How's that ever going to be fulfilled, the, the promise of a beautiful layout? And that's where we come in. I'm being a little bit mean by pulling the words world's worst website up as a background of the slide. Um, but I think we have a failed promise of a beautiful design. Look at any premium theme, almost all of them. You look at the preview, I mean, we all do that for some clients, you just don't have the budget for something that we make bespoke. But look at what we get. We, we look at the preview, oh, this looks beautiful, the clients see the preview, they love it. And then we download it, it's like, hey, how am I gonna get from here to there? And I don't know there's a lot of talk about WordPress theme repository, the official, that you know we need to bridge this gap. This is a huge, huge challenge. Um, but we shouldn't take lightly on that. This currently it requires a designer to do a good job with, with page builders. And I don't think that's really the purpose of a page builder, do you? So what we should be doing, of course, is decoupling content from design. We should slowly but surely make sure that users enter content specifically not content that they design in a specific way, but strictly speaking, just content unformatted that we then as designers and developers can use in different areas. Because by doing this, we're preparing for the future. And what does the future look like? Well, nobody knows, of course. Now just look at this. I, I put up like tablets, smartphones, we've got iOS, we've got Android, we've got multiple more operating systems. We've got all the array of responses and screen sizes that we have today. Um, years ago about the new Apple TV with apps, of course, we've got Google equivalents, right? I'm device after device after device, and what's going to come tomorrow? We have no idea. The only thing we do know is that we're going to have something new tomorrow, which we don't have today, which is going to require something new. Now, what can we do, for example, when we get a new device? Let's say Apple. There are rumors that they're going to release an even bigger iPhone this fall, right? So how, what are we going to do then? Well, we're going to create a new design that we're going to adapt for that bigger screen. What are we going to do when the content is mixed in with the design? Well, we're going to have to do a whole lot of work. Right? But what if the content were separated? I'm coming back to it. The only good way is structured data inputs. Because then we know, all right, this is a title. This is a medium description. This is a long description of this content. We know that we can pull various content that we know that the clients entered in a fairly similar way, because we can tell them what we expect. And, you know, anyone's probably going to comply enough with these instructions so that we, you know, roughly know what we can expect when we pull the content out. And that allows us to iterate very quickly when a new device comes out, because we have the content source content, we can just create a new updated design version and pull the content that we need. Whether this is a new device, like Apple TV, TV apps, whether it's a new phone size where there's a complete new device. Again, we don't know, but we're catering to the future by maximizing the possibilities. So how would an ideal editing interface look like? Well, that's a, it's an interesting question, and I'm going to present my thoughts. So the ideal editing interface in page builder, again, as I said, it's not built yet, in my opinion, which presents us a bit of a problem, right? How are we going to build the ideal page builder? The thing is, it's tricky. Of course, the first thing that we need to make sure we have is the structured data input. And I bored you enough with the talk about structured data inputs, but I really believe this is so crucial and important. 
But where we sort of lead on from that is it needs to be compatible with the API. We've got to talk, I know, the developer room on the, on the REST API is really the future uh, of a lot of WordPress-based applications. And of course, we need to be able to query all the content that we put into a site easily out via the API so that we can use it in good ways. Now, depending on how you would build such a layout today in a page builder, you're going to get a lot of meta fields. And that's, I mean, we can get that with the API, but we can't necessarily easily get it in the structured order that we may have implied when we created it. And here, I don't have a solution to this problem right now, but it's something we need to think about when we're, when we're creating these page builder style applications for our clients. It's tricky, and we need to think about how we can solve this. And we should give clients absolutely no visual control whatsoever. <laughs> Again, don't get me wrong, I think that the drop-down menu where they can select from the, the key brand colors, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but they can also select the color of the text. We're going to define some predefined blocks and stuff that they can use. Of course, they're going to be able to select how many columns they should have in an ideal world, etc., etc. But there's a difference between limited and controlled visual control and basically allowing them to do whatever they want or have to follow a printed brand manual when they're updating the website, which again is not helping them do things efficiently. And this might be a bit controversial because we're talking a bit about adding uh, visual editing and front end editing to WordPress, and I don't think that's the future at all. Now clients have always wanted to know, all right, how are these edits going to look on my site? Well, the problem is, it used to be really easy to say, well, here's your site. Right? Here's the content you enter, here's exactly how it's going to look. Right? How many devices do you think you can pull together in this room alone? And how many screen sizes do you think you're going to get? I think quite a lot. So how are you going to preview this for a client who's updating their website? So he or she's going to see that, all right, in these three columns on my desktop right now, it's looking pretty good. I've balanced things out. I've, I've in my mind, unconsciously created something. But then again, we get devices, and it's looking completely different from what it should. And that's a problem. Even actually having a, a grid layout, for example, you're creating a grid in the admin panel. Let's say you get a visual indicator that it has three columns. That subconsciously creates in the mind of the user the urge to adapt their content for this exact layout. But as we've said, we can use this content in so many different ways. And I think we've just begun to see how many places we're going to be pulling in content as an external database resource. We're seeing even more now with the social platforms creating their sort of own publishing channels, which we might want to jump on. So by not giving the client any visual indications whatsoever, we can actually remove the urges and the biases that the mind has to design the content, even though they have very, very limited options of doing so. We can remove that completely, which is ultimately going to lead to them creating better interfaces because they're just entering the content in, with relatively strict rules. And as designers and developers, we're doing our job to make sure it's set displayed beautifully. And of course, being a non-native English speaker, translation is really, really, really near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm based in Sweden, born in Sweden, and I'm gro I've grown up with the fact that one hour, two hour play right away, that's another country speaking another language. So the fact that we can't get, and WordPress is lacking here. I mean, since we don't actually have multilingual support built into WordPress, which I think is a, is a great shame, we can't really do this really well until we actually have it, unfortunately. But we built a few for clients using the Advanced Custom Fields Flexible Content Module, which is excellent. It allows us to, to create some pretty compelling editing interfaces. But when we translate that, for example, with WPML, it's a mess. It, it's, I can really describe it in a better way. It's, it's really not an ideal workflow. We need to be able to solve the multilingual support in anything we build, um, because that's, that's just partly the way future of WordPress is going to be. <laughs> And something really important is that it needs to do things the WordPress way. 
I've been complaining about this for years. I know that I said I did a similar talk to this a few years back. Uh, it's slightly different though. That's when we had each designer, developer, plugin developer, theme designer doing millions of different theme options panels that they did in their own design way because they didn't really think WordPress was up to speed right now. The danger of saying, hey, I don't really think WordPress core is where I want it to be right now, so I'm going to roll my own thing and it's going to look completely different and it's going to be really good. The problem with that is, of course, that the client, the end user, is going to have no idea how to work with it. And that's a problem. There's actually, you might think there's a danger to the fact that our websites look fairly similar, but that's in fact a strength, at least in the back end, because clients know and know intuitively how to work with them. If they've used your page builder style application and it's designed similar to mine or to his or to hers, then the client's going to really know how to work with this. And that's a strength. And that's one of the reasons why WordPress itself has come such a long way. Because if you look at custom post types, if you can create a post, you can create virtually anything that WordPress has to offer because it's so similar and it's built up in the same way. And that's a strength we really need to play at. And of course, it goes without saying, it should really be extended a lot by plugins. Um, and this is really core to WordPress today, extensibility. Uh, this is sort of more development related, uh, but if we don't let a plugin or a theme or a module extend and, and add their own module sections, etc., we're, we're really not getting anywhere with this. Because what we need to do, of course, is create something that's so bespoke to the client's actual needs and doesn't contain anything extra that the client's then able to use it because there's going to be no bloat in it. And this sort of brings me to the theme specific styling aspect. Right? We don't actually need page builders or, or any sort of editing interfaces that present the clients with 100,500 different options and modules and sections that they can't really use on their site and that they don't really need to use on their site. You only actually need quite a few different blocks and modules for a client to be able to design a pretty compelling page. And by limiting their options, we can ensure that they get a better page. And I know all of you know how few elements really go into, say, a landing page or a marketing page today. It's really just repeating the same amount of blocks. Which is interesting, at least to me, every time I do this, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit because the client thinks this is so much you know, work and just laying that out, while I have a library in my head of five to ten different modules that I'm just placing on a page. Part of me feels that way. But it's really important that we cater to our theme, our client's needs. It's when we don't that we create extra bloatware, that we create extra problems for our clients. Because, hey, what's this module doing here? I don't know anything about it. Unfortunately, some of the page builder plugins that we can look at today, they come with a million different combinations of modules that, yes, you could remove, you could keep them, but they're going to add their own styling, and it's hard to get that removed. It should be completely custom to the actual site we're using. And just be able to say no, nope, no styling necessary from the core of this page. So this is really the ideal world. The problem again is it doesn't exist so much for the perfect world. It still doesn't exist. But I think we're getting there if we're allowing an interface to, for example, for flexible content pages, it's essentially the services where we can't really say what the common elements are going to be on the page, but we know that we need to build them up flexibly using blocks. We have to have, I think, some sort of page builders. While they today have a lot of pitfalls and, and bad elements to them and aspects to them, they still show a future, I think, which is really compelling. The promise of a really easy, beautiful layout creation, no coding required to do that, it's not just something that a client as a designer developer, I found myself really enjoying to use a nicely made page builder because it reduces the time that it takes for me to create that beautiful page as well. And I think that's also really important. And then for the standardized things, let's say adding a client, adding a staff members or whatever. These really easy custom post type inputs with structured data fields, with good descriptions and good labels, actually walking the client 
comfortably through all of these steps really goes a long way. So when you hand off a site that's built like this to a client, you don't have to have that manual that says, right, to add a staff member, you go to staff, you click add new, and then you get the first field and you type that in. You can basically just say, sign in for the website under staff, you'll find add new on the list of staff, and, and then the interface is going to guide the client. And I think that's a really important, interesting way of actually getting the client to do more work on their website, which they otherwise wouldn't. The website would go stale, wouldn't be updated, and the client would be calling saying, hey, I don't remember how to update more, I don't know anything. They're probably still going to ask what's the, the login URL and what's my username and password, so I don't think we're going to get rid of that anytime soon. But once they actually get in, we can do so much more to help them do the most easy tasks that they need. Whether it's restaurant updating their menu, opening hours, phone numbers, contact details, this is going to vary depending on the actual business. Some may never change their address. Some may change their address and contact details all the time. You know that when you're actually creating the website for this business. And that's the important thing. Catering to their specific needs will result in them actually updating the websites. And then reminding them that they actually have to do the work. Unfortunately, that part we don't have control over, but we can make it as easy as possible for them to do the work themselves. So that gets us through the end of this talk. Um, we do have, I believe, a full two minutes for questions, because um, we got started a bit late. I will be in the, uh, the happiness bar for the next hour or so, and around all day if you have any more questions. So does anyone have a question right now? Uh, so the question is, um, I say that it doesn't exist, this perfect idea of or, or am I creating it? Um, I would like to say yes, we're working really hard on that. Um, partially. So we're exploring all the time for each new client that we're doing, right? How can we make this sort of page builder be more efficient and then be better? Um, so we're learning in that process to see, all right, testing out hypotheses, what's actually you know, the feasible way of doing that, which is partly why I've also had the realization that this is pretty tricky to create this standardized thing that can then be distributed, you know, as a core thing. So while we're certainly working on that, we're not there yet. I think this is really a good community project. We could debate whether this is even something that ought to be in the WordPress. Dare I say the words? Um, but it's going to be a long process, I think. So, um so for um, developers slash designers who are working with the existing system that we have, I haven't done custom posts in quite a while. Is this for, if we took a child theme, for example, would a designer be able to use an existing theme and add this, or does this have to be built into the theme itself, this, these custom type posts, etc.? Not yeah. more of the page builder at all, so I yeah. don't um, you know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, so you could add it. Really, custom post types and all data handling functions, I mean, they're really a way to store data. They should be added by plugin and not a theme. Custom post types should not exist in the theme. Because what happens if you change the theme, you're going to lose your content, which is really, really bad. So you could do that. It's, it's also not a, a difficult for <laughs> plugins to help you add custom post types if you as a designer. To do that. Yeah, I tested that, but I tested that in the, in the um, environment which I was trying to create my own theme, and I'm not, as I've learned, a good themer. Right. So I've decided that I'm much better off using existing themes than fully customizing. Yeah. So we could work in that context. It, it, it could absolutely be. Step back.
some of them do some of these aspects you know, very, to varying degrees, really good with that. So some of them, well, I think they're really, really bad as well, they're like leaving bad code in place, they might do another aspect of this really well. I don't think there's, there exists a page that does everything right now. Uh, no, no, we have to develop a plugin. So right. You know, make sure you build a layout, you save that to the library. Yeah. You use your plugin, and then you add that layout to the library. And then you just create a page for you. So yeah. That's a kind of a, a way that external developers, if you like, can get it around modular yeah. sections of, of uh, page that you don't actually want to use. Yeah. So that's it. yeah. I think that's a really good point, a really good tip. Right. But I think that. Um, we're going to have this as the, the last question because we're. I, oh, the next session is going to start in eight minutes. Uh, I just. Okay. I think that what you were trying to say earlier, though, is you don't want the clients to be focusing on the layout and that they should no. be focusing on content. Yeah. So presenting them with the layout, from what I understand from this lecture, is that it's probably not what you want them to do. Is that correct? Right. Because what we do, I mean, again, clients' wishes are, I want to see exactly how it's going to look. But my point is, we, since we actually can't preview them exactly how it's going to look, we can't give them, we, we can't essentially give them what they want. So we're better off not previewing this at all and having them preview the site, use the site instead on all of these different devices. I don't see another solution, really. So if we preview them uh, a layout, they're going to work with this layout in mind, which is going to hinder us for mobile or tablet or, or any site screens or any other applications of this. Um, and I think it's, that's far worse. Um, I think it's much better if the content just existed and we as designers output it in a beautiful way rather than having the client decide over how it's outputted uh, more than what's absolutely necessary, which to build a page to varying degrees will be necessary. All right, so thank you all very much for, for coming out.